Happy Halloween, everybody! This is me, Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel, in case you hadn't recognized me. This is a program about painting and drawing and just being plain silly most of the time tonight. I'll take calls from you. It can be about anything. Painting, art, Halloween, anything. So have a good time watching. I'm going to be painting something strange. A pyramid, of course. A Buddha, naturally. A candle, an old vase, and an ancient dish. All in a row, just like the Egyptians did. Would you watch? Be very careful to watch carefully. Well, you can say something. All right. Then I guess I have to talk. I am going to be painting these objects because obviously in this kind of outfit, I should be painting something slightly ancient looking. So I picked these props. The costume, of course, comes from costume art in Babylon, New York, uh, which is a rather remarkable place. There are 4,000 costumes or more to be available and to be uh, rented at any time uh, on Deer Park Avenue in Babylon, in case anybody wondered about the wonder of this costume. Uh, the makeup is, of course, me. And any time that you want to call, I'm sure that they will put uh, it on the screen for you to be able to telephone me and we can talk about anything at all. Nothing tonight is supposed to really make any sense and not even the storm. And so when you call, I will, uh, I'll talk. Uh, we can talk. Uh, I'm doing this pyramid now because I work from life. No matter whether or not um, it makes uh, a great deal of sense at this point, but I am working from life and I'd like to talk about that. I would like to talk about working from life is far more interesting than working from anything else, namely death. So I'm going to uh, now put this vase in here. As you can see, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, dressed for the occasion uh, of painting this picture. And um, the studio, of course, is dressed too. These are some of my, some of my other uh, favorite friends that I'm uh, entertaining this evening. And in case anybody uh, has a comment, uh, it, where is the number? Oh, is the number on the screen, please? Uh, a gorilla, give the number on the screen, if you don't mind, uh, so that we can get some people to talk to. Uh, their trick-or-treating, I'm sure, has been totally uh, uh, filed up uh, tonight, so you have to watch me. There's nothing else to do. There's a call? Oh, wonderful. Uh, hello there. Happy Halloween. Who are you? Happy Halloween. Mark from Stony Brook. <laughs> Mark, hi. How are you? Fine. I was curious, I'm curious to know, if I wanted to have a portrait done of my wife. Yes. Um, you know, a very good quality portrait. How does one go about finding um, a portrait artist? There is, a, there is an organization in New York City called Portraits Incorporated. They have a gallery where you can go and pick the style that you want, and you can pick the price that you want, and the artist will more than likely come to your house for the sitting. And that's all I can tell you, Mark. Well, I, I appreciate it. For Portraits Incorporated. I have it down, and you have a very happy Halloween. Thank you very much for calling. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, um, so we have, um, we have here the, uh, we have here the, um, I could have told him, of course, that I do portraits, couldn't I? Oh, maybe he'll call back, because I am a portrait painter as, as well, and uh, I'm, I'm reasonably sure that I'm not as expensive as Portraits Incorporated. So in case he, he wants to engage me, he can either call back or write to me in care of this station, and then we can go from there, because I do portraits all the time. Anyway. Um, I have now drawn these wonderful ancient objects, and I'm going to begin to apply paint. I work in oils, as you may have gathered. Uh, I have a, a palette here, which I am... Um, excuse me, Fox, I'm going to remove you from the easel. You've had your day in the sun. Um, I think that the first thing I ought to do, seeing as how I'm in this costume, is to paint the pyramid. The pyramid is a... Um, is a magical form, at least they say it is. I have a feeling that possibly the pyramid is simply wonderful design. And so I'm going to begin to apply the paint this way and see if I can make it shine. Uh, it does funny things. Pyramids are not uh, 
Pyramids are not um, totally sensible. They, they have funny lights hitting them in different places. And um, this little pyramid is made of glass. And therefore, it's got all sorts of strange uh, manifestations of light and shade, which means, uh, which means that there's another call. So I shall now uh, deep, deep, deep paint the pyramid and take the call. Hello there. Please tell me who you are. Uh, my name is Elaine. I've been watching you uh, as long as possible, and I enjoy your work so. You are such a fine artist that I was wondering if you give any uh, art lessons or can advise me. Well, I would uh, dearly love to be able to say, yes, I give art lessons, but being a full-time painter myself and running the, and doing this show, I, would have, I have no time to, uh, to instruct. It is difficult for me to tell you because I don't know what kind of uh, painting you want to learn. There is a wonderful painter who uh, works, uh, who is at the, uh, I believe he's still at the University of Stony Brook. His name is Robert White. He's one of the great American painters and he does teach there. So you may want to call and see if Robert White is still available or sti see if you have to pass any kind of a, well, of a, of a proficiency test. That's about the best I can tell you. I don't know of anybody else in the area, except that I don't really know what it is you want to learn. Okay, I was really so anxious to j tell you how much I enjoy your work and how much I enjoy watching you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'd be, uh, I'd be, I would be delighted. If, if I did teach, I would not have time to be able to pursue my own painting. It's, it's a full-time job, especially if I, t I... I would take it so seriously that I think I probably would never sit at my own easel again. No, I can understand What's that. your name? My name is Elaine. Elaine, how lovely of you to call. I thank you so much for your time. Good. Okay, thanks again. Have a nice holiday. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ah, oh, what a lovely thing to hear people out there. Uh, not cast adrift in the storm, but out there watching. Yes, I have another call. Isn't that nice? Uh, please tell me who you are and let's talk. Hi, I'm Barbara. Hello, Barbara. And I'm from Ronkonkoma. Ah. And my, um, I'm calling and asking about uh, my sister-in-law who's in Europe. Yeah. She's a painter. Yes. And she'd like to exhibit some of her painting here. How, how does one get to do something like that? It is extremely difficult. I, uh, I, would, I would, uh, would love to be able to give you a very simple answer and say, oh, we'll have her come to New York and take her paintings to various galleries, but I'm afraid I can't do that because the galleries are very difficult to contact, very hard to get in touch with, and the best thing that I would probably suggest is that she contact some museums or galleries in Europe, wherever she happens to be, and ask them what uh, she should do. From here, it is almost impossible possible to find out. Yeah, I see. I, I think that the galleries there might be able to have some contact uh, with some galleries here in New York or in Los Angeles or wherever. Yes, she's so, in Austria. She's in Austria. Well, yeah. Austria, of course, is, a, is, a, is the seat of, of great culture and art, and I'm sure that she would probably be able to find somebody. She probably will have to show her work at, the gallery, at a gallery in, in, in Austria and then ask the question. Just be perfectly honest. I want to go to New York and show my pictures. How do I go about it? Oh, that's great. You know? I, I, I love your painting. We, Thank my you. husband and I watch all the time. Oh, how lovely of you to say. And uh, we, where, does your, where do you display your work? Well, I, I'm showing in, in uh, there's a gallery in Brooklyn called Belanthe Gallery uh, on Court Street, and then I'm showing also in Bethesda, Maryland. Oh. Um, Bethesda is, is handling my work in Maryland, and I have my own gallery on Long Island here, but I'm very rarely there, so it is pointless for me to tell you where I am. I see. <laughs> <laughs> well, Long Island would be much better for me to see you. Yes, <laughs> I understand that. Well, please write me a card, and I will not fail to answer you to tell you when you can find me and at what address. Okay, that's great. Good. Okay, Appreciate and I love your, your costume. <laughs> you look great. Oh, thank you. It's very, it's, it's very silly, but it's right, it's great fun. And uh, w once once a year, why not? Why not? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Thanks for calling. <laughs> bye bye. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, we're now, I've now done about as much as I'm willing to do uh, for this uh, short program on the pyramid, uh, just to show you how to handle these different um, textures, and that's what we're dealing with. I have another call, so I'm going to continue painting and talk to these people as they call, because there's no point in your watching me talk to anybody. Hello there, tell me who you are. Hello. Oh, gone. Yes, hello. Oh, hello. This is your first call to Mark from Stony Brook. Hello, gentlemen. Mark, again. Right. Good you, for you. You indicated that um, 
you might be interested in doing a portrait. Sure, I do the portraits all the time. How would I discuss this with you? Why don't you, uh, why don't you, please write, please write me your address and your phone number to uh, care of this station. They will get it to me post haste and I will respond immediately. Okay, very good. Good. Thank you again. You're welcome and thank you for calling. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, yes, I think that the best idea to get in touch with me is through this address, which I think is probably as simple as anything. Um, well, I'm now dealing with this incredibly uh, mysterious Buddha, which I think is, um, uh, it's part of a, well, I th I'm, I'm, I'm loath to admit that these are bookends, but um, having chosen this for this program, more for fun than anything, but at the same time, something can be learned from this. Namely, when you're dealing with these forms, you have to pay attention to the fact that they are textured and that the light falls on all sorts of unexpected places. And when they do, uh, uh, the, the painter that works from life doesn't question where the light falls. He simply follows the directions that the prop gives him. Uh, props are uh, props are wonderful uh, when you work from the uh, from life because they um, they don't hold any secrets. Whatever is there to be painted, it is in front of you. Uh, not the same uh, when you when you are working out of your imagination or when you are uh, tr trying to create something which is um, which is with, uh, which is without um, reference material. Um, I'm talking about when when you see programs that talk, talk about going out and painting mountains. Well, those people are nowhere near the mountain, and their reference material is minimal. Therefore, I, I have always, as a realist painter, found it's very difficult to uh, re to reconcile the fact that there is um, that there are painters that are painting without reference material. So I must use reference material, and I choose to bring it into the studio here and work from it in front of you to show you that there are no tricks. There's no magic. There's no magic white or black or yellow. There's no magic anything. It is all observed and concentrated um, techniques of what you see is what you paint. And... Um, that has held me in good stead for a very long time, and I find that the people who watch me paint uh, like to hear about the tricks and the thing, not tricks, uh, they're not tricks, uh, the information and the techniques and styles that one must do in order to accomplish this kind of thing. So here we have a shadow. I'm going to paint this Buddha's shadow that is running directly across his little flat chest. And there it is. That's what's going to make this head look like it's sticking out. Um, I find that uh, I must, I can use some black here sometimes. Uh, and these props, these belong to me. I don't own museum pieces. I own interesting props. And I like to, um, I like to bring them in and use them in my compositions. Many times I, um, I do use them in my serious compositions. And uh, I have a collection of vases, which I find always great to have in case you, because I'm a floral painter. And um, I think that anybody who uh, ha finds themselves needing to select uh, things to paint are going to need these props. So uh, this candle, of course, is a perfectly ordinary candle. I mean, burning brightly as it is now, it has a sort of a nice feeling to it. I don't usually paint burning candles, but this is a special evening. And um, we decided to play along and have a great deal of fun, just like I hope most people are, despite the uh, rather intense storm outside. And I hope that the children are safe and so on. But here we are with this little Buddha figure. He... Um, he is, uh, he's not of the greatest quality, but he certainly has a kind of an attitude about him. He looks sort of old, and he's kind of got, got looks like he's got some old green stuff on him. And, and he, um, it, it, it's the kind of thing, just like uh, many times you look for a prop that is not going to do, uh, do bad things and change. This guy can sit on your shelf for the next 50 years and never change, and you'll be able to go back to it and paint it whenever you want to. So I always try to find props that I either don't have to return immediately or that I own. And so uh, if people are thinking about doing this kind of painting, think about the selectivity. Uh, the originality with which you select your pieces is, vi is vital in many, in many uh, instances. And um, the painting of it is not always the most difficult. It's selecting what to paint that sometimes proves to be a problem. Okay, we have another call, which is uh, very nice. Hello there, please tell me who you are. And Hello, what? this is Rose. I've Hello. called you before. Yes, Rose. And I'm so happy. I came down from up downstairs from a sick brother-in-law, and I said, I must try set, uh, uh, Channel 6, and there you are. <laughs> oh, there I am. Oh, great. Yes. My question is, I need 
better brushes. I haven't, I'm having too much luck with my brush. I should get to the ball and buy some. Now, how can I make the finest, finest line? Okay. What kind would it have to be? Uh, the Point. brush is called, it is usually called a striping brush. Striping? Striping brush. Uh, yes. It has a very long bristle, uh, and it's thin. I get my supplies, and I do not have this, these people do not sponsor me, so don't think that I'm plugging anybody. Mm -hmm. I buy my supplies in East Meadow at a place at Pearls. called Pearl Paint. Mm -hmm. And um, well, you I... will go to the brush department and ask for a striping brush, and uh, anybody, you, I mean, you might even find it yourself in the case. I see. But that's what I use. And for other work, such as you're doing now, and it would have to be, uh, the width would have to be less than a half inch, that would well, be another know, good you, brush? If you get a good brush, it's going to get pointed uh, down to the size of a, of, a, of a thin hairline. Oh, that's wonderful. See, if you, you mean it's, it's an all-around brush, then? Yeah, be sure that you get a red, be sure that you get a sable brush. Don't get the camel's hair. Would that be white sable? No, red sable. Red sable? Red sable. Oh. Oh, yes. I see. And um, they cost maybe, I don't know, 7 or $8 or something like that. Oh, it's and a good investment. Yes, oh, absolutely, yes. especially if you take care of them. Yes, it's worth it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a striping brush is what you need. I think that when you go there, you'll find them in the case yourself. Uh-huh, I yeah. see. Yeah, well, Rose. Well, there is a place at the mall. What do you need? What do you need? No, the mall is no, Nah, the mall doesn't have very much. Well, they do have brushes. That's why I say that's the only place I can get to. I can, uh, I'm unable to get to Pearls over in East Meadow. That's my problem. Oh, uh, well, you know, make an excursion someday and get there. If but I I'm sure that they, listen, listen, that the, the, the art shops in the mall will have a striping brush for you. Just ask for it. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, Rose, thanks for Great calling. Great to talk with you. I See? loved it. <laughs> I thank you. Thanks Bye for calling. Bye-bye. Oh, good. Here we are. Well, I, we're sort of getting to work on this little Buddha. I, I mean, you know, what, what can you do in, in a short space of time? Ex but, but try. And hope, uh, hope that you can uh, get a point across and, and tell people that um, working from life is the thing to do um, and to not be intimidated by it and to just plunge. Take the, take the plunge and do it. You'll find yourself completely amazed at what you're observing for the first time when you look at something hard enough to paint it. Uh, that's what I always find is interesting to do, to, to, to stare at something for a long time and by golly, you discover how the most extraordinary things uh, that you never knew were there before. And it doesn't matter if it's objects like this or if it's a plain old onion, you will discover lovely and wondrous things about all of these strange textures that we live with and take for granted most of the time. Well, let's let's leave the Buddha sitting contemplating. Oh, there. Let's leave the Buddha contemplating whatever it is that this Buddha is contemplating and go on to the next prop. Because all I'm doing, really, is kind of doing a sketch. I mean, a really quick sketch of this stuff. And I have another call, so let me take the other call. Yes, hello there. Who are you, please? Hi, how are you? My name is Leon. I've been watching you for quite a while now. Good. But, you know, I have a problem here. I, I haven't taken any lessons or anything, and everybody's telling me I've got some sort of talent, hopefully. Yeah. But uh, what I don't understand is the different brushes. Ah, different brushes. Well, I, as you may have noticed, if you've been watching me for any amount of time, you notice that I don't use many different brushes. No. I use pretty much the same brush all the time. But there are times when you have to have that very fine brush that that lady just, that Rose just called about. And there are times when you have to use a, uh, a larger brush for larger spaces. But for the most part, I will use a number eight or a number uh, six red, red sable flat square cut brush like you're looking at right now. What is your problem? Okay, well, uh, I don't actually use oils. Ah. What, what I do is I use acrylics because it's a nice, fast drying thing for me. That's right. And uh, I can put it right up on a wall as soon as I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> Instant gratification, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but the thing is that I, I, I notice fan brushes. I, I notice some of these painters, they use big, big paint brushes. I yeah. mean, what's, what's the requirement for this? Do you really uh, need all that stuff, or do you just go for just a few brushes and... Oh, uh, painting with a uh, house brush is, uh, is perfect for painting on the walls, my dear fellow, but certainly <laughs> not for painting pictures. Um, yeah, that is all extremely difficult for me to remain rational about. I find myself really very distressed by that because it's, it is... Um, it is growing a crop of people who are producing perfectly dreadful work. So get the small brush, get a number six or a number, anywhere between six and, and ten, and work with small, deliberate strokes. Do not be taken in by this business of great big wide brushes covering great big spaces. 
it is uh, it is not painting as I know it. I thought so. I thought like I was cheating. <laughs> <laughs> well, the word cheating, I suppose, is a rather harsh and maybe out of place, but uh, I have often thought that possibly that is the term to use. <laughs> well, let me ask you something. Yes. When, when you do your signature at the end of the painting, yes. All right, what kind of brush is that? Line that brush is a striping what? brush. It's just what I was t talking to Rose about. It's called a striping brush. It's used probably just to put stripes on automobiles and things, but it's a very, very long, very flexible, fine, sable bristle. Uh -huh. And I use a lot of turpentine with it to reduce it to sort of ink consistency. Okay. And um, there's no way of being able to make a signature without using that brush. So in other words, you need it to be more liquidy. Yes, it needs, it needs to be liquid and it needs to be done on wet paint which is something that maybe I have not mentioned before. It, you have to sign the picture on the wet paint because of many reasons. The, the, the paint will marry or be blended into the paint itself and therefore um, it is part of the painting. Many times there are forgeries of um, paintings that people have signed on top of dry paint. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so it's, um, if, you paint, if you put on top of dry paint, it can be taken right off. I didn't know that. <laughs> I know. So, I mean, it's always, it's, it, you know, it's great to find out these things either accidentally or purposely. So, pay, so sign your paintings um, immediately on the wet paint of your canvas, and it'll be there forever. Nobody can take it off, unless, of course, there's a paint remover is used. But, um, and use a striping brush and try to use your handwriting if you possibly can. Okay. Can I ask you another question? Of course. On canvases. Yeah. Now, I see there's a, there's a board canvas and there's a... Uh, Regular canvas. Stretched is, canvas. Yeah, is, is, that, is there any, really any difference if you paint on either or? Yeah, uh, board canvases are cheap and they tend to warp. And over time, uh, probably in a hundred years, the board canvases will not be worth anything. Oh. Uh, don't use board canvases if you can afford to get, um, if you can afford to get the real canvases because they simply is no lasting quality. And supposing you produce a masterpiece, you don't want it to disappear in a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> I know I won't be around. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. Your family will be. It doesn't matter whether you're around or not. I mean, it does matter. I hate to, to make you think that I think you're, you shouldn't stay alive, but I think that if you do a masterpiece and, you're, and a member of your family inherits it, how disappointing it would be for your great-grandchild to suddenly say, oh, my God, my great-grandfather's painting has now fallen apart because he painted on a, on a bad board. <laughs> think about it. Yeah, I know. I'm just think about, about it. If I am going to have a masterpiece, but it may, it may happen, hopefully. Think about it, of course. I mean, you know, we're, we, are, we are mortal. And um, the possibility of your lasting 100 years is very remote. But your painting could last 100 years. Yeah, I like to do a lot of scenery. That's, well, that's my main paintings, is really scenery. I haven't gotten into faces yet or into objects. But I, I do a lot of scenery from memory. Well, please, please bear in mind that we want these paintings of yours to last a good long time. And don't belittle yourself by saying it probably won't happen because it could. Mm. And it, it, you owe it to, to your ancestor, to your, to your heirs. You owe it to your heirs to uh, paint on good canvas. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate your calling. Bye-bye. <laughs> I'm going to take a break now because we've had some wonderful calls. I'm going to um, uh, be back very shortly, oh, great Halloweeners that are watching this. Halloweeners.
Hiya! Back again, old great Halloweeners, at the Cable Easel, Patricia Windrow, doing a painting of ancient objects with great mystifying qualities to it and also taking phone calls. Now, it probably was on the screen, but if you call 348-6800, you can get me and we can talk. Can we talk? Good. Let's, uh, let's just talk. In the meantime, I'll just jabber on at you again and, t and, and tell you about what I'm doing. I selected these pieces, as, as I told you uh, when we opened this program, just because of the fun time that we decided to have on the program here because it has fallen on this very special night. I was brought up in Europe and Halloween didn't mean very much to me until I got here as an adult and then all of a sudden I found that there was some strange ritual called Halloween and so I've fallen into it and here I am in a ridiculous costume talking to you and there's a call. Will you please tell me who you are so that we can talk? Oh, my name is Anne. Yes. I love that flame. <laughs> Could you please put a dewdrop on the cup? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll put a drop on this ancient <laughs> vase. <laughs> I, I beg your pardon. I'll put the I'll put a, a dewdrop on this ancient vase. Oh, do do that. Yes. Because I love dewdrops. Oh, you're speaking. I think I recognize this voice. Do you really? I do indeed. I think this is the voice of the lady that uh, let me wear this costume. Oh, you're quite right. <laughs> I'm Edge. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> what a lovely idea for you to call. Hello. I'm in Bayshore watching you. Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that the initiative took place and that you found a, a, a set that, um, that gets me. I did. Well, this is the lady uh, that I told you about earlier who runs this remarkable costume place called Costume Art. Hi ho She also happens to be my sister. Goodbye. Thanks for calling. Well, isn't that lovely? Uh, it's not, it, there's nothing quite like having family. Anyway, um, uh, the... the, the, the um, the uh, selection of costumes, as you can see, they're really rather remarkable pieces, uh, is uh, almost endless. And uh, they're right there, she's right there in Babylon. And in case anybody needs a costume for next year, don't forget costume art. That's what it is. Okay, let's get moving on this jar. Uh, here is the, uh, here's the magic of working from life. Um, the light has fallen on this part of the opening and I have another call. So while I'm doing this uh, opening here, let me take the call. Please tell me who you are. Yeah, hi, my name is Ken. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes, my name is Ken. Ken. How are you? I'm well. Uh, for the last uh, couple of years, I've been watching a wet on wet technique. Wet on wet. On another uh, channel. Yes. And for the last few months, I've been watching you. Yes. And I was kind of curious. Uh, it would seem to make more sense to paint the background and work your way forward to the foreground. And you seem to always paint your picture first and then work towards the background. Why is that? Well, uh, one of the reasons, uh, when I paint a landscape, I paint the farthest p part away from me first. That's for very obvious reasons. Um, the reason that I do what I do here is so that I can get as much information across to you as possible in the shortest period of time. And I do not paint wet on wet. Uh, it is a technique which I not only disapprove of, but I would never use. So pa my painting a background would mean that you would have to sit for interminable minutes while I paint a background with a small brush with deliberate strokes and make sure that I'm getting exactly the way I want it. Now, that may not sound like a very good explanation to you, but uh, the, the best explanation is that I do not paint wet on wet. Therefore, I must paint the objects first. And if a background is needed, a simple background in the background, uh, that can be done at a time when I'm not got an audience. And you feel you get the same kind of blending finish? Without yeah, you get the same kind of what finish? Area. Same kind of what finish? If you get the same kind of blending finishes that you get oh, yes. with an open canvas versus having all these things already in place and having to work around it? It's very hard, but I do it. Um, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, to get the blending is difficult, but that's what painting is about. It's difficult, and it should be done with deliberate strokes. It should never, never, ever be done with an enormous brush just putting a background color on and then working on that. That is uh, simply not, that is not an acceptable technique for fine arts painting. Thank you very much. You're welcome, and I'm glad that you called and brought that up. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Um, as you can see, I'm putting the shadows in to anchor these things. I have another call, which is uh, a lovely idea. Please tell me who you are, and we can talk. 
Hi, I'm Linda. I would like to know, uh, what do you recommend to someone who wants to start painting but has never had lessons? Well, I've never had a lesson either. So what I tell you, what I would tell you is from a true personal experience. If you are determined to learn how to paint, then get yourself the best supplies. I don't mean by buying a $60 palette. You can put your paint on anything. Witness my piece of masonite here. But get yourself one or two good brushes. Get yourself stretched canvases. But above all, you have to have the absolute insatiable yearning to do it. That's one of the main ingredients. And then you have to figure out what it is that interests you. What do you want to paint? Because the possibilities for painting are enormous. So what ideas do you have? What would you like to paint? Portraits? Uh, sceneries. I, I like to paint scenery. Ah, you know, very well. And then, seasons. Okay, then my advice is to paint scenery from, from life. That you get out there into the environment and paint sceneries from life. Uh, the advice I have is to never expect to do it in one sitting. Find a place that you know you can go back to the next day at the same time, when the light is the same. And um, set yourself up in a shady spot, because you cannot paint in the sun, it distorts the color. And uh, there are some remarkable books on the market. I think that you, if you were to investigate and find some of the books on landscape painting, you would find some very good ones. Well, thank you very much. But do not, do not be intimidated with the fact that you have never had a lesson. Okay. Should I get a start? Is there a starter kit I could get? Or? Um, write to me, please, at this station, and I will send you a list of the colors to get and the brushes to get. Uh, gladly. I will be more than happy to do that. Oh, thank you so much. Please. It's, uh, it's here on uh, 1600, uh, 1600 Motor Parkway, Hopog, New York, um, Cablevision Channel 6. Um, please don't hesitate to write, and I will, without, without fail, I will answer you. Thanks very much. Thanks for calling. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. We are, um, I'm, I've, I've managed to zip on right through this for some reason or another. It's going very well, even though I'm talking my head off to the people, but we've gotten to the most difficult one of them all, and that is that very shiny and rather beautiful turquoise bowl which is over at the end, and I've painted this as a whimsical, uh, I don't usually paint what I call parade pictures. This is a parade picture, but I wanted, it to, I wanted it to have a sort of an Egyptian feeling, and anybody who has ever looked at the reproductions of Egyptian tombs uh, knows that the uh, Egyptian painting is usually done in uh, in a rose. It's, uh, it's a storytelling. It's the, way the, it's the way the Egyptian tombs told the story of the life of that particular um, uh, human that was, is herein buried. And so uh, the whimsy that I did to pick this uh, parade painting is uh, merely for the evening. It has virtually nothing to do with a general lesson in composition. It probably is the kind of thing that should be avoided, except that if we can pull this off, um, uh, then maybe there's nothing too bad about parade pictures. There are lots of, uh, lots of lovely things that you can put side by side next to one another and have probably an acceptable composition. So I'm using, I'm using a manganese blue here, a touch of yellow green, and a touch of um, Prussian blue, um, toned down a little bit with some yellow ochre, and I'm going to hopefully find that that is my shadow color that is being cast in this bowl. Um, I, I love to be able to look inside objects so that I can see what it is that the shadows do. Because I have a real thing about shadows, uh, having learned that shadows are what make the three-dimensional quality. And so when you see that this, this little bowl with just two colors, I believe, tells you that there is, uh, there is depth in here and that the bowl is, um, is round. And I, th I think that possibly I can put uh, the little, the little. Um, well, let me, let me, let me rinse my brush because my thing is also keep your brushes clean, and I must put a rim on here. Um, every once in a while, I get a, I get a view of myself in the monitor in this costume, and I cannot believe that somebody hasn't called up and said, "What is absolutely ridiculous lady doing in that costume?" Except there's a rather nice costume, don't you think? And do call me if you have anything to say. There's a call. Three four eight six eight hundred is the number. But let me take this new call. Uh, hello there. Who are you, please? Hello. Well, somebody 
Adrian must have called and decided that um, uh, I wasn't here. So that's okay. Maybe they'll call back. It's difficult to, um, to be able to monitor some of these calls sometimes. But anyway, here's the underside tone of this lovely little cup, which is not ancient at all. That was an absolute lie. It's not ancient at all. It's part of a set of, of uh, things. But it uh, sort of looked ancient because of the color. And I, I, I kind of thought it went very well with the, uh, with the other things. And so this is the way one would attempt to this cup. The inside of, uh, of this little handle, of course, is dark. And then the outside is that same color with a little bit of white and pale, pale on the top here. Of course, the fun is going to come when I do the highlights of this cup, Main, mainly uh, in, a, in a studio that is lit like this. The, um, the highlights are multiple and also extremely brilliant because of the quantity of lights. Um, uh, uh, I find myself... Um, talking to people many times about uh, selecting things for paintings. Um, how, how do you select them? That is almost impossible. It's almost like saying, I'm going to tell you what you like to eat. It is, it is that large a subject matter. What appeals to me may not appeal to somebody else and may not interest somebody else, else enough to pick up a brush and try to paint. However, there are certain suggestions. I would say that when you are looking for something to paint and you are a beginning, to pick something which is within your possibility. In other words, I find people say, I'm going to start painting and I'm going to paint a wave. Well, probably the most difficult thing in the whole world to paint is a wave. Uh, water is, is, uh, is a challenge, it is mysterious, and it is exceedingly difficult to paint. So, until such time as you've kind of gotten used to your business of painting, uh, stay away from the wave and uh, find yourself something which is probably a lot less complex and a lot less um, moving. Uh, find, choose something which sits still, for heaven's sakes, for a reasonable amount of time. Namely, um, uh, pots, objects, um, uh, things which, uh, which do not rely upon the out of doors for lighting. And we have another call, so while I keep jabbering away at you, I'll take another call. Yes, hello there. Hello, Miss Window. Yes. Yes, I'm just watching the painting you do, and it looks great. Thank you. I mean, I love the Egyptian theme, and the, your costume is lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Well, as I said before, once a year, why not? Oh, sure. <laughs> but um, do you ever think of doing the pyramids someday? Oh, oh, you mean painting, painting? A pyra the pyramids? Uh-huh. Well, I want to get over there because, you know, I'm so obstinate about painting from life that I won't do it from a photograph. Oh, you won't? No, huh? I simply won't. I just will not work from photographs. And um, if I've been advising all these people all these years to not work from photographs, then I'd jolly well better oh. not start and do that and be uh, guilty of it. No, I thought you did very well from the photographs. I've been watching you for quite a while now. I never work from photographs. Oh, you don't? Oh, no, no ma'am. How about those? Oh, no, no, that was uh, the flowers you did, that you did from real life, the oh, real yeah, flowers. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I work. Yeah, no, you're right, you're I right. work from life only. Uh-huh. But, um, so if I ever do go to the pyramids, I oh, shall certainly... Oh, I'd love to see you do it. <laughs> I will set up my my easel at the foot of the pyramids and, and go to work. do it. That'd <laughs> be beautiful. Now, I want to ask you a question. My husband, he draws very, very well. Yeah. He's a natural, he can... Take anything and draw it. Wonderful. Now, what do you think about him trying painting? He should. It's time he did. If Don't he knows, you think he could? If he knows how to draw, then he can paint. I'm trying to get him to paint. Ever since watching you. Well, do it. Where's your influence, madam? I mean, madam? I couldn't do it, but I know he, I think he could do it. Well, of course. So make him do it. Uh, I mean, at least suggest that he do yeah, it. Yeah, I, I did. I have. I and mean, he, you know, just doesn't do it. But, is, he, uh, is, is he watching now? No, he's sleeping. He goes to bed early and gets up very early. Okay. Oh, and I'd love to see, uh, you know, have him see this. Well, there's no reason why he can't, but he has to have the dedication. You see, I said that before. One of the main ingredients is to be obsessed by it. Right, And right. if he wants to do it and he's obsessed by it, he will do it. Yes, I guess so. But if he draws, boy, he's got a he, lot of the battle it, won. He draws beautiful, beautiful. Well, then he can, then he, can he would paint. be... He would be a candidate. Yeah, I guess he would have to go to some kind of a class or something. No, right? I'm self-taught. He for doesn't colors? have to go to any class. Not for colors? No. No? No, let him experiment and fool around with it. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah, but no, he I... Paints, he huh? paints... Excuse me, he paints all um, our things in the yard, you know, our... Uh, 
Polar bears and all flamingos and you know he does all that and they come out nice. Yeah. But that's different than uh, you know the painting that you do. Oh yes, of course. Well, I mean you you know if the man if the man is dedicated to painting something, he's going to get some paint someday and just do it. Well, I just love your painting. I watch all the time. Well, I'm so pleased. And much Thank good you. Good luck. Thanks happy, for calling. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween to you. Goodbye. Oh, well, we've gotten the, we, while that was going on, I put the highlights on the bowl, which I find is rather, uh, rather a cheat. I should have waited for a little bit, but we'll do, I have another call. Okay. Hello there. Hello, Hello Mrs. Leonard. Yes. I'm glad you're back from Europe. Ah, thank you. And I'd like to know when you're going to have a clinic. Um, a clinic is difficult at this time of year because I want, I would, um, I would have, I would be wanting to do a, a landscape clinics. Oh, I understand. And so, I, I, if I if I if I decide to do any of that, I will announce it sometime in the uh, in the spring and figure out just exactly how and where we can do it. It is very difficult for me because I'm a full time painter, and uh, that kind of thing would require a tremendous amount of time and, and and effort. And I'm afraid it might cut into my studio time. But it's a lovely thought and a good idea, and I'll sure consider it. Well, you're very good, and we enjoy your painting. Thank you so much for calling. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Ah, so we have, uh, we're, we're zipping right along here. We're not actually zipping right along. We're, 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 we're working rather hard on this kind of thing and being, uh, trying, trying to figure out what I'm looking at and uh, see the multiple lights here. The television studio makes it absolutely uh, wonderful to be able to um, talk to you about how you put these shadows and things. And well, here's a shadow for this bowl. As I said, uh, there are many, many lights here, and that means that it casts multiple shadows. So I'm just going to pick the middle one, which, which is a reasonable thing to assume that the, uh, the middle shadow is probably what you would have in your own environment. And the shadows are important. They, um, they uh, give a three-dimensional uh, feeling to the painting. It also anchors them. They're not, they're not little cutouts and, and decals that, uh, that they would be otherwise they didn't have this shadow. And I, oh, that looks rather peculiar. I must say that uh, there. So, um, with the exception of now probably applying some of the dripping wax on the um, on this candlestick, and trying to give uh, some feeling of um, a background, which uh, somebody was concerned with before about a background. Uh, as I say, the time does not allow a background to be done on these pictures. I discovered that many years ago when I was doing this program and, and the audience was saying it just takes too long and it's tiresome, we didn't learn anything. So I do the objects. Here, here I'm going to uh, interpret uh, the dripping wax, which I see from, from my subject matter, is, is a pale color. It also uh, runs down and then it stops in little globules and no way in the world would I be able to invent this. I have to have it before me to be able to understand what is happening. Um, you will see that the, uh, the details of this kind of thing are vital to the realism that I'm always after in, in my pictures. Um, I will do a drop of water for the caller that called, uh, who uh, requested it. Uh, she uh, has many paintings of mine, uh, and each one of them has a drop of water. So this is in, uh, in deference to that lady who called, namely Midge, my sister, wants to see me do a water drop. I would like to be able to, um, uh, to um, do it on this old vase here. And a good tight shot will probably be the best, the best um, way to show how these things are done. So uh, a water drop is a formula. Uh, it casts its own shadow. Hence, um, I'm going to put a shadow of the drop right over here. And then I'm going to give you the outside. The outside of a drop is always, it is the color of the object upon which it's, it, it sits. So water being transparent means that it has to have the color of its background. So here, assuming that the light is coming from the well I, well, I will call it the northwest. This is probably the way the shadow would fall on the um, on this vase. We'll lower, make this a little bit deeper so that it can uh, receive a um, 
a spot, um, uh, what we, uh, I'm looking for a word, the uh, highlight. When you talk this much, you forget what you're saying. And the highlight goes right there, and it should shine, unless I put a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a highlight on this side of the drop, and that should make it uh, look like it's shining. I hope that, uh, m that my sisterhood is, uh, re is well instated now, because having fulfilled her request, there is a drop of water on the old vase. Uh, I don't know how that, what the time is doing, but it looks like we're in good shape. I'm going to continue to work on the, um, you see this, uh, I'm on the Buddha in for just a moment. See this um, shadow over here is not as dark as the ones uh, by the Buddha because the Buddha is solid and the pyramid is glass. Hence that shadow is going to be lighter. I think I have another call. Oh good, all right. Um, please tell me who you are. Hello? Oh, yes, hello? Yes, sir. Yes, my name is John Lewison. Hello, John. Oh, uh, yes, I have a question. Yes. Uh, did you know that you're really smelly? That I'm what? You smell. Oh? Well, that's a rather amusing thing to say on Halloween. That's all right. Uh, you cannot, um, you can't shake me up. John? Um, I find myself uh, always amazed at that kind of uh, behavior, but uh, not perturbed in the least. Um, and I have another call. Yes, let's have another call, please. Hello there, who are you? Hello. Yes. I'd like to uh, ask a question, please. Sure. When you finish with your paint in the evening, how do you preserve them? You certainly can't put them all away off the easel. Uh, well, I have a studio, so I don't have to put my paintings away. They stay in the studio until they're dry. Oh, and you don't cover them or anything? Oh, no. Oh, I see. Oh, no, uh, the air is what they need. Oh, I see. I thought that that would deteriorate them by leaving them exposed. Oh, no, I'm working in oils that last for years, hundreds and hundreds of years. Oh, I see. So, so the oil certainly will not deteriorate. You have to cover pastels because they fall apart and the wind bothers them and so on. But oils are, um, oils are permanent. Oh, I see. Well, I thank you ever so much. Thanks for calling. Thank you. All right. Um... So, we have now, uh, we have another call. Very good. Please, uh, please tell me who you are. Oh, hello. Yes. This is Joanne. Yes, Joanne. I was wondering, what do you use to paint on? Is that canvas or? This is a canvas board. This is an inexpensive piece of canvas board. It is canvas that has been glued on top of a piece of cardboard. It is, um, it's the kind of thing that I use because it's easy to transport. It doesn't puncture. Uh, when I have to take this out of here in the studio, uh, you know, a studio is not, I mean, a, a television studio is not the safest place in the world for painting, so I don't bring canvases that can be, have holes driven in them. And so, and besides, it's inexpensive and I'm able to, uh, to uh, use these demonstrations um, and not, not, not worry about failing. Well, as a beginner, should I use a canvas or something else? Uh, yeah, I'll use a canvas board as a beginner. Okay. Because it's the difference between paying one dollar and paying eight dollars. Okay. And, you know, so it's so it certainly is something to be considered. But when you're try when it's trial and error, and you know, and you you might make mistakes and you might hate what you're doing, it's pointless for you to do it on an expensive piece of canvas. Okay. And one other question. Yeah, sure. And that's oil paint you're using. Yes, ma'am. And one other question. Yeah. What exactly? can I use as a palette and what do I do with the paints when I get all the oil paints how do I well my best advice is that when you squeeze oil paints out on a counter palette squeeze out very small amounts very mm -hmm. small amounts only what you need for the for a few minutes don't ever don't ever squeeze a whole big thing out on your on your palette because the chances are you won't use it and then it'll dry up and you'll be you know it'll, it's, a, it's a total waste of paint and so be be um, stingy with the way you squeeze paint out and then uh, you can in fact leave your palette with something over it so that the air doesn't get to it but the best advice is to use small amounts of paint uh, in small squeezes. Oh, so you can save the palette, say, for example, for the next day? Oh, absolutely. And possibly the next day after that? Oh, my dear, I have a palette on my easel that I, that I save for weeks and weeks. No, I mean the paint. It oh, well, the paint gets a skin on it, just like any other paint. And, uh, you, the, you know, the skin kind of protects it from, from, uh, from drying out entirely. Oh. And so, um, uh, you know, I mean, this, uh, the paint will dry out, but... Um, 
y you know, that's to be expected, you know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for calling. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, it looks like um, this session that we have done here, and I'm working with my little, uh, my little Buddha, uh, has been for... There's a call. Okay, let's, uh, let, me, uh, let me have the call now, please. Yes, hello there. Hello there, this is Laura in Comac. Yes, Laura. I noticed that uh, you don't dip your paintbrush into the turpentine very often, and yet your paints don't get muddy, and I was wondering if there's some secret to that. Well, the secret to that is probably some sneaky thing, that, t technique that I have developed over the years, that I use the color that is on my brush at the moment to go where I need to go with that particular color. It's a habit, and it's a style that I have developed, but it, is, um, it does not mean that you um, that you don't have to keep your brush clean. Uh, if 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 I if you don't see me rinse my brush, it's because the camera is on the work and it's not on me rinsing my brush. But I do rinse it far more often than you think. Uh -huh. Do you do you have any hints about clean? I I often hesitate to start my paintings because cleanup seems to be such an overwhelming chore. Do you have any hints about? Cleaning up when you're finished? Get a studio. <laughs> 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 Try and find some way of getting a, a room dedicated to the business of painting. Uh -huh. And then, uh, you know, I keep my studio as I I in fair order. Uh -huh. But I must say that when I do not have a studio and I'm on the road and I'm painting somewhere else, you're right. It is a chore to clean up and to get everything disappeared and to try to function. Right. Almost keeps you from starting. It keeps me from starting. Yeah. Well, you know, th there's a certain... Uh, one of the more... One of the more annoying things to have to do as a painter is to prepare your canvases. Mm -hmm. But you know what? You have to do it. That's true. Thank That's you. I, I love watching you. I'm watching you as we're talking. Yeah, well, that, I'm, I'm painting as we talk, and I'm putting the gold highlight on this. I see. Which is, um, you know, the fun part. Good luck. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Same here. Thank you. So Bye-bye. Okay, we're going to put a little bit of highlight on here and see if we can see there's a highlight, there's a, highlight, a very strong highlight here and another one highlight there, but it also continues into the shadow. So that means that the highlight in the shadow is going to be a little bit dull. Uh, things to be observed and things to be remembered, but nevertheless part, all part of the business of being intrigued with, um, with, with painting uh, from life. Another call. Good. Well, this is a bonanza. Hello there. Uh, tell me who you are. Hello, this is Bob. Yes, Bob. Yes, uh, I'm here watching you, and it's really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, and I was curious to know if these paintings are up for sale when you're finished with them. Every once in a while, I do sell these pictures that I do on TV, but I go home and, uh, and um, I go back to my studio and I revise them. I don't revise them, I refine them is probably better. If uh, you're interested in any of them, do write to me here at this address at 1600 Motor Parkway in Hopog and tell me who you are and I will respond and tell me what it is that you'd like and I'll respond. All right, because you also uh, piked up my friend here who's not feeling well and she's an artist. Ah. She does some work and uh, my background was I was born and raised in the village. Uh, uh, Lower West Side. Yes. And at Fourth Street Park, uh, many years ago, they would have all the artists display their works out. Yes. And I was really interested. But I noticed when you when you paint, you never seem to make a mistake. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Well, that's very complimentary. I'll buy that. I think that's a nice thing to hear. Uh, I do make mistakes, of course. Um, the television camera is very kind to paintings. There are many times that there are things that I do that don't really show up on the camera. So it's, it's, not, exactly, uh, it's not exactly that I don't ever make mistakes. It's simply that you don't see them. I see. But, uh, you know, being that it's live, I think it's remarkable. Well, I it... want to comment on your costume. It's beautiful. Thank you. It's uh, <laughs> my costume. Well, that was great. That was great fun and, and a rather good idea that everybody here at the station had said, you know, it's Halloween. Let's just do something silly. So we did. But um, the point is that uh, um, when you work live, uh, it's a challenge. It really is. And I'm, I'm glad to see that you appreciate the fact that the thing is, uh, is, is a challenge. Yeah. Well, nice talking with you. Nice talking to you, sir. Thanks for calling. Okay. Bye-bye. Ah, uh, do we have another call? 
No, okay. I thought that I thought that you had signaled me. Anyway, my um, my composition, which I have called a parade painting of ancient objects, and uh, that's uh, that's more whimsical than truthful, is the fa is um is now just probably needs a little bit of refining, maybe a little bit of more dramatic highlight here on the shoulder. Um, probably just some fussing around is all that this is going to really take to uh, to make me content with what I have done. I'd like to be able to um, uh, know that uh, all the paintings that I do are of, are of value, and I mean, uh, not I don't mean monetary value. I mean informational value to the people who have been watching. And when I when I ask you to write to me, please do because the um, the station here is very cooperative about that, and and I get all my mail promptly, and um, I uh, have I don't think I've ever failed to answer a letter. So do write and. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I have, hopefully it will be uh, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I've got two more minutes to go. I'm going to do the same thing that I do many times, uh, and that is to talk about the signature on these things. I'll put a little bit of gold on his knee, I think. I think, I think this Buddha deserves a little bit of gold on his knee. Right here. Oh, too bright. Too bright. All right, tone it down. I washed my, I wiped my brush, whoever that lady called and said, I don't wipe my brush. So I wipe my brush and um, to, to tone down that highlight, and there's a little one that runs back there. Well, this is um, this is, I could probably put some kind of a glowing thing around this candle to make the flame appear to be a little bit more um, diffused instead of instead of it's looking like a Christmas card candle. I could probably just put a little bit of flame because the flame is is very white in the studio here. So maybe just sort of diffuse that a little bit and give it a glow. Um, I'm going to sign this. I'm going to date it. I believe that everybody should date their pictures, um, amateurs and professionals alike, so that there is some idea of when they were done, because I believe in doing things for posterity. And let me push this over a little bit, and I'm going to sign this painting, and then wish you a good night. So if you want to watch me do this, uh, you have to steady your hand a little bit, and it's a good idea to always do it down on the lower left. Get your striping brush. This is for Rose. Striping brush, Rose. Do it on wet paint. This is not wet. So I'm not practicing what I preach now, but that's because this is a television program. In real life, I only sign on wet paint. And I sign it in my own hand, which means that it takes a little bit of practice but it's worth the effort because I don't think that uh, printing one's name uh, is uh, as professional looking as it might be. And I always usually sign it either 1989 or just plain 89 or whatever. But do put, a, do put a, a year on it. And if you can print small enough, put the place on it that it was painted. Um, the paintings that, you, that have tremendous value, Picasso's paintings have tremendous value because uh, they are signed by Picasso, and the interesting thing is about Mr. Picasso, he never signed anything until it was sold. And so he put wet paint in the corner and signed it, and that protected him from theft. And anybody stealing a painting from Picasso, if it didn't have a name, wasn't worth anything. So anyway, well, I hope you've enjoyed this silly business that we've gone through tonight. It was a happy Halloween for us, so I hope it was for you. I'm glad you tuned in. I appreciate all the calls. Um, don't forget, every the last Tuesday of every month is when this live program takes place. So on the last Tuesday of November, we'll be back. Please tune in on the cable easel during the week. Thanks for watching. This is Pat Windrow saying bye-bye from the cable easel on Channel 6 Cable Vision.